Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Axiomize with Ashish Darbari. We're going to talk today about live locks and deadlocks in Knox. Ashish, what is a live lock and what's a deadlock? And how does it apply into a NOC? Excellent. So a deadlock is when a system is stuck in a state and is unable to recover from it. It could happen due to a state being stuck or a bunch of states being stuck. With the live lock, the interesting thing is the system gives you a view that is actually making progress, but the progress is not a useful one. So you can almost think of it as a counter that constantly increments and decrements by one, but it's actually not doing much. It's staying in the sort of same locus. So that's the key sort of difference between a live lock and a deadlock. And how does it apply into Knox? Right. So the Knox are actually particularly interesting for these problems because of the way they work. So Knox is network on chip, of course, and it's a point-to-point -point protocol and anything on a grid can talk to anything else. And the routing algorithms actually then end up having this problem that you have dependencies between messages and channels, which then create a situation where you can actually prevent the eviction of the message, uh, or you can actually have messages that actually run in loop, creating live blocks. So it's very easy because of the circularity uh, and the graph-like nature of the knocks that these problems are very difficult to find. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Ashish, what are we looking at? Right, Ed. So what we're looking at here is a simplified version of a knock. So what have we have here is a bunch of routers that we're showing with R. And the routers are actually connected to what is called processing elements, PEs. And all of these PEs are actually arbitrating for the same router. So they are making a contention to transmit some data. And these PEs could be processors, they could be GPUs, they could be any other uh, processing element. And the reason they want to talk to these routers is because they want to go and fetch data from somewhere else that they may not have. So they're trying to find data because the NOC is moving data. And they will then go into the memory so you can have a cache in a processor that doesn't have the data, and it may want to snoop the data from a neighboring PE, which is connected to this router, and or they could go to memory to get the data back. So there's a lot of data movement happening, and it all needs to happen quite fast. And that's what makes this thing very challenging for verification. How do box and Deadbox fit into this picture? Awesome. So. What we're basically trying to do is that each of these PEs that make connections with the router, the router needs to be able to transmit the data via this path. It may need to transfer data through this path or through this path. So there are multiple paths to the same end destination. So you have dependencies that can actually easily arise on this grid, or you could have dependencies arise between these PEs and the routers. And because nothing is really simple, so the data transaction that happens between the PEs and the router, or between the router and the main memory is through complex protocols such as AXI. Uh, we could also be using ACE uh, for coherency. We might be using Qi. So now you have a scenario where if you didn't have these protocols and you had a simple valid ready protocol, things were already quite hard because of dependencies and the packets circulating around, not going anywhere useful. Introduction of these bus protocols, which is necessary, of course, for performance and scalability, has now compounded the problem of live lock and deadlock. So now you can have live locks and deadlocks arising because of the channels on these protocols, and one channel exercising a back pressure on the other channel. You could have it because the two PEs can't talk to each other sensibly in the way that they can't arbitrate over the access to the router. So let me draw you a little simplified version of what is going on in the context of PEs trying to access a router. So let's imagine you have PE0 and PE1, and through some cloud of logic, it could be it could be a bus protocol or it could be any other logic. They are trying to access this shared resource. So you can call this a router. But actually, within the router, you would have an arbiter, 
and let's say some other logic that defines the structure of the router. And now what's, what we're trying to check is that every message that originates from this PE must make its way to the arbiter and the router, and the router should be able to push it out to the next stage. PE1 should also get a chance to actually be able to access the router. And assuming a perfect scenario, that actually PE0 and PE1 are both able to send infinitely many requests, we would like to see PE0 and PE1 being given a chance on the other side. It should never be the case that one of these PEs end up hogging the entire router forever, and the other PE is denied the access. So now the variants of live lock and netlock become very interesting. So if the PE1 can never get hold of the arbiter, then you have a problem of deadlock, meaning you're denying access to this particular fella and PE0 is being treated preferably. If PE0 and PE1 can both get access but not get access infinitely often or with a certain frequency, you may have a performance problem. And this could also lead to live logs. So a very simple example of this is, let's say these chaps, PEs, are actually talking to the router through some kind of communication uh, protocol. And this could be, again, an AXI. It could be valid ready. It could be a credit scheme. And any of these things could actually create more challenges. So for example, the chaps on this side, for example, if you talk about the credit schemes, the chaps on this side need to know that actually these guys have got enough credit to be able to transmit the data. And if, for example, this fellow ends up sending the data to, to the router and the credit scheme somehow ends up favoring this chap over this chap, then we have a problem. How do we check this? That's another challenge. So how do you verify this? How do you check it? How do you know you're getting exactly what you're supposed to? Yeah, so we do this with formal. And the way to do this with formal is to normally write what is called liveness properties. And if you know what SVA is like, we actually write these properties. So they're called liveness. And what it basically means is that every packet originating from PE0 must be granted on the router. Every packet originating from PE1 must be granted eventually. It doesn't mean it has to happen one cycle or two cycles or 100 cycles later. And most of the time, you would actually write these properties. They're not very hard to write but they actually don't prove very fast. And that's where the problem is, especially when the designs are very big and you have multiple PEs in equation and you have bus protocols. So in that case, we can use forward progress checks, uh, beta integrity checks, those kind of things. So they make the problem more deterministic uh, to do this. But the baseline is you need a combination of these tactics uh, to be able to find these. And simulation will not be able to actually do anything meaningful because of the indeterminate number of cycles that you don't actually know uh, when things will happen. On your critical data paths, you may be adding in margin that's additional circuitry. You may be adding in different ways that you can reroute signals. How does formal play with that? So what we are saying is you have a performance bottleneck. Uh, that's what we're talking about. So. It is very easy to check these things with formal so that so long as we actually know what we are aiming to. So for example, you could have a watchdog timer that actually is watching the state of this traffic flow. And we know that the watchdog timer has to come down within a certain interval. Or for example, this has to throttle X many times, this has to throttle Y many times. So we could do that kind of analysis with counter-based modeling uh, in formal, and we can make those judgment calls for performance verification. It's quite common. However, it does introduce more complexity challenges for conversions, as you would expect. One of the things about Knox is you're dealing with coherency too, right? Data coherency. Correct, correct. So for example, most of the artificial intelligence machine learning architectures, which are doing a lot of parallel processing and they do need parallel competition, they also rely on fast caches and you have heard of HBMs and so on. So coherency becomes a massive bottleneck. So coherency between different PEs here but also we could want to have coherency between this PE and this PE. So coherency, again, whether we are implementing this with ACE or with G, then brings another level of dimension of complexity. 
And every time we want to make things fast, we know what happens. We make things wrong. We could introduce interesting bugs. And one of this classic example of this is this recent case study that became known of the Netflix uh, issue. So Netflix ran into some performance issues and they did some analysis on their code. And they found that actually there was not that much wrong in the actual code they had written, but actually it boiled down to the hardware implementations of the cache lines actually doing what is called false sharing. And the cache lines were sharing data for, for non-shared variable. Um, and that caused a lot of performance issues. So again, going back to how coherency can actually impact the entire stack all the way up to the application software. And going back to the performance question that we were, we were talking about, so it's all kind of intertwined. So knock verification for deadlocks and live locks is not just a routing challenge because these coherency mechanisms involve much more complexity in the analysis of these deadlocks and live locks. That's a very important to point out. Ashish Darbari, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.